Three types of gypsy. So we have a, um, a Romany gypsy, uh, we have the Irish traveller, and we have a New Age traveller. There's obviously a difference between Irish travellers and English Romanies, because they come from Ireland, and um, myself comes from England, but Romanies come from all different parts of Europe as well. What we do have in common, we have nomadic ways of life, and we're still very much minorities, and we have bridges and um, barriers to both get over. So the Polish, the Chrome, the Crown Derby, the Angsley, all the fancy crockery, mm. there are only little small places, but that was their own. That was, my dad was king of his castle when it was a caravan. <laughs> <laughs> we had heavyweight champions of the world that were knuckle fighters. So we just held on to that traditional way of settling arguments without the gloves. Mike Tyson probably would want to hurt you, yeah? He probably would want to hurt you. Yeah, maybe Lenny McLean, he probably would want to hurt you. But not this gypsy lad. I didn't, I just wanted to win my fight and get my own backside out of it in one piece. I was so eager to get out and go and play with all my cousins. And um, I went out to play and my cousin went to throw the right-hander again and I just went, dump, bang, <laughs> have that one. On a God-given day, he could knock me back off balance. On another God-given day, I could knock him off balance, but we just couldn't beat each other. My first ever paid fight, would you believe, I was probably about 10 now at this stage. 10? Yeah. He was right around the corner from my grandfather's yard. 200 yards away so the boxing training had stopped but what we were doing now was golf every day now this is really fun now we're golfing almost every day it come into my skills are really showing through so i i won like the, the richmond open i won the london junior open which was a big event uh, it was televised dennis thatcher giving me the prize i look around i see some of my friends over there of different backgrounds some of my friends that are black and we're all one yeah. I don't do the colour, creed, background, crap. I do good guy, bad guy stuff, you know what I mean? Those little things, shake hands, take an out off at the end of the round, they're priceless. They might be little minnow things in the scheme of things, but I'll tell you what, they go a long way, mate. Go a long way, those little things, for me to do anyway. All right, so this interview is thanks to Christian at KRN TV. He has hooked us up with Gypsy Joe. And I'm just going to read to give you a flavor of what's coming. The back of the book, Kushti, some of it anyway. So Joe spent his early years traveling, his father metal dealing and mother selling Lucky Heather. Have you heard of that, Lucky Heather? Yes. All right. And as an infant, he was encouraged by Grandfather Rhymer to reject the gypsy tradition of fighting and to take up golf. When Rhymer died, suddenly Joe promised to fulfill his grandfather's dream and become a professional golfer. Trophies followed, and Joe's future seemed assured. But not everyone was happy about the Wonder Boy's success. False accusations were made, and he was asked to leave his beloved golf club. The effect on Joe's self-esteem and game was devastating. Anger burned as he fell into bare-knuckle fighting and crime. His role models were thugs and crooks, no longer sportsmen. Only when prison loomed did he reflect on the course his life was taking. Remembering his promise to Rhymer, he spurned the underworld and returned to golf, where he reduced his handicap, turned professional, and competed at the highest levels. Kushti is not only a story of redemption, but also an uplifting account of a young gypsy man's determination to realise his dream regardless of prejudice and the odds stacked against him. So huge thank you for coming on, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for both having me. And, and thanks to Jen for being here as well. The link for the book will be in the description box, as will links for Christian's KRN TV, as will links for Jen's Organic Cotton Clothing Company. Of course. Before we get into the story, Joe, there's a lot of confusion about the word gypsy and traveller, and there's different types, apparently. Are you okay to clarify to the viewers then? Because we have a lot of viewers out of America that, that may not be familiar with these terms in particular. 
Yeah, well, in, in the UK, um, I think uh, we have, at least to my understanding, three types of gypsy. So we have a, um, the Romany gypsy, uh, we have the Irish traveller, and we have a New Age traveller. And I think um, the New Age traveller live a type of nomadic sort of life with very little history. So they're just dropped out of their main society whilst they come from main society, if you like. Gorgeous, we say, from gorgeous society, but they've taken up that way. And I don't think they have um, much history uh, beyond them, but they, for the few I've met along the way, whilst still practising my nomadic way here and there, whilst I have settlement, I still travel a little bit. I've met some nice people, and um, there's obviously a difference between Irish travellers and English Romanies, because they come from Ireland, and... Um, Myself comes from England, but Romanies come from all different parts of Europe as well. Uh, we originate from India some 1,350 years ago. And obviously the Irish traveller originate from Ireland. Not sure how long ago. You'll have to maybe ask, you know, an Irish traveller of um, that sort of question. I'm not too sure. But what we do have in common, we have nomadic ways of life. And we're still very much minorities. And we have bridges and um, barriers to both get over that's the best way I can describe it. Is there a misconception that Romani people think that's gypsies that origin out of Romania? Uh, that's not the case. There might be a misperception, but um, is it uh, that Ro they roam? They roam no, nomadic. Yeah, it's 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 um, more of a, a Roman way of life as opposed to they come from Rome. It's been or Romania. It's been um, mis uh, confused with, but it's not. It, it, as I say, they originate from India some 1,350 years ago, give or take, and a set of language went with it. Mm -hmm. They um, didn't agree with their rulers, so they put up a... They said, kill all these escapees, if you like, or the people that are rebelling against that system back in them days, and they formed their own language as a defence barrier. And um, we very often get accused of speaking foreign language when it's deemed rude and sinister, when the truth of the matter is... We're only really using it to save an embarrassing moment or as a defence. Mm. So we could use it if somebody was wielding a knife or something. We could use that language to defend ourselves. So it's not all uh, ways as seemed as rude. <laughs> it's defence. <laughs> or we could save an embarrassment moment by using our language. Of course. Yeah. So, bare knuckle fighting then, is that just part of the traveller tradition? Where did it or originate from? Well, it's, it's um, yes, it's very much what you tend to find with the traveller traditions. They hold on to traditions longer than possible they should. And that happens in lots of things, you know, lots of different areas, you know, like where, uh, should I say, um, Christians, old Christian values was no sex before marriage. Now, that doesn't happen very often, I'm led to believe, but, but that would hold on possibly longer in the travelling areas than it would the norm with all due respect of course and there's some some nice people out there from the normal background that hold on to those values but i would say it happens predominantly a little more and now it's the same with the fighting we hold on to traditions now you bear in mind we had heavyweight champions of the world that were knuckle fighters so we just held on to that traditional way of settling arguments without the gloves so it was a very english thing actually um, knuckle fighting but we've held on to it longer than again you mate up number 44 North Road he might get the boxing gloves out to do it right but we still do it with no gloves but its orig origins are from England and not necessarily from the gypsy or Romany backgrounds we just held on to that what do you think about the success of Tyson Fury oh well what can you say he's heavyweight champion of the world um, absolutely Fantastic, wonderful. I think he's conducted himself very well as the champion. Being a champion in the ring is one thing. Being a champion out of the ring is another thing. And I haven't had too much, um, haven't heard too much bad about the champ. Um, in fact, one of my friends was on a long haul flight with him, seven hour flight, and he actually said, if you wanted to design and paint the heavyweight champion of the world, it'd be Tyson Fury. So <laughs> that's brilliant, isn't it? Eh? So have you met him? I haven't met him. No. It's, it's strange. Um, I recently learned that my grandfather um, was a professional boxer, was very good friends. My, my grandfather mentioned his great uncle, Ticker Gorman, 
very much. I've, I've heard the story, so many stories about his great uncle. So the nearest we've really got together is my grandfather and his great uncle were good mates, both heavyweight boxers fighting on the professional and boxing booth scenes. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. When he bounced back up after Deontay knocked him down that one fight, that was just incredible. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. It's almost ghostly like wasn't, wasn't it, it? it was. he went who's that getting up that can't be my opponent <laughs> yeah, that's not him is it I just knocked him out <laughs> one of the funniest things I've ever seen uh, what a recovery but the way he talks about his mental health battle as well that's yeah. really admirable and inspirational absolutely yeah, yeah. I mean um, he's, what, he, what I like um, is he's, 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 he's already given back and he's still a young man but he's got the maturity to, to, to realise the fortunes he has and the talents he has because they're god-given talents you know you're not just blessed to be six foot nine and, and dance around <laughs> like a middleweight you know <laughs> these yeah. these are god-given talents he recognizes that and and he's a young man he's given back and i really like that you know because um if he can help one person he's done a huge amount if he can help hundreds i mean you can imagine what he potentially can do mm. so field. so does the traveler community in general find his success and inspiration then and is it a kind of like raised um the profile of travelers worldwide through his success i think so yeah i, I think somebody with that success and as i say as i said earlier that portrayed himself as a, as a good guy how can it be negative to us it can only be positive you know from the irish romany traveler backgrounds which i think yeah if tyson's actually got a bit of each i think i think Has his mum's mm. a bit of romany and his dad's irish so it's, it's a bit of each so it's a it's a fine balance perfect balance for well, both groups mm. um yeah no, but, but fantastic yeah it can only be a positive so you said it's, it's like a nomadic lifestyle then um, so where were you actually born within that nomadic lifestyle mm. well, i was born in west london okay. Iserworth, um about seven miles west of the city um and we didn't have settlement then my grandparents did but they weren't licensed to have a caravans uh, only a couple of caravans so we were still roaming around so i come out of my hospital into a caravan for the first 11 years as my family grew. I've seen uh, a photo of that caravan. It's very old style, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Back in those days, the old chrome in bits and pieces. And, you know, my mum, just like the other um, gypsy girls, that, that was their home and they were very, very proud of that stuff, you know. That was so the polish, the chrome, the crown derby, the Angsley, all the fancy crockery. Mm. There were only little small places, but that was their own. That's. My dad was king of his castle when it was a caravan. <laughs> <laughs> so that happened for 11 years for me and before we, we found settlement. What does settlement mean? Well, we, we found an house in our case. Um, we, we, my, my, there was four of us born um, quite quickly together within five years. And then my mum and dad, I was a baby for eight years, mm. spoiled rotten, and then my young oh. brother come along, right? And my baby sister, and it quickly become apparent to my dad that we, we, we couldn't move around there wasn't enough vehicles, um, enough drivers, etc. So he, he, he was looking for settlement. So we, we luckily we found some settlement in West London again, where my great grandfather and grandfather then was handed the land down the line. So it was it was home for me. It was a nice location because it it was where, where I was sort of pretty much we were familiar with. My dad was schooled there, etc. So, so that was settlement. Yeah. If you're moving around, then how does school work? <laughs> in my case, there weren't no school, and it's quite strange again. Um, my five brothers, my, my, my two brothers and three sisters, they all went to infantry school. So they went to their first school, as we call it. They didn't go secondary. But for me, I was always with my dad and I never, I never went to school. So can you read and write? Thank God I can. <laughs> oh, Christ. I got very lucky. <laughs> no, but, you know, people can get ghostwriters. That's you true. You know, so That's, you wrote that yourself. I got very lucky um, in terms of how I become to read and write. Yeah. So you wrote the book yourself? I wrote the book myself, but Fantastic. I got lucky. An old gentleman, we were camping um, in a field, a beautiful green field in Portsmouth, Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And this old bloke turned up in a car and nicely dressed, and we thought he was somebody of authority, probably asking us to move on. So we thought this would probably be the end of our stay in this nice green field. We'll be served with papers, which was part and parcel of the nomadic way, yeah. And um, he arrived out and he went, I'm here to help you people. I have a great way of teaching how to read. It should be recognised by the government. Um, please let me, allow me to help. So, you know, um, we embraced his offer with a cup of tea. My parents welcomed him into our trailer. 
and he learned me the ABC quickly, and and then the pronunciations, you know, uh, of the ABC, and he continued to give his time from Portsmouth to Epsom in Surrey and Amworth and Alzo, respectively. That old man gave me his time, and I'm forever grateful. I actually mm. get emotional thinking about it. I can see mm. it like yesterday. He gave me his time, and quickly I picked up papers and whatnot, and I learned how to read. So you had your own private tutor well, almost. But but it just come out of nowhere. It wasn't planned, right. and he only spent about six or eight weeks with me. But he's, And that wasn't daily. That was once a week for six or eight weeks. But he spent a few hours with me, and he was so good at what he'd done, and I was so interested. I took it on board. And I learned because my, my dad, um, in his early childhood, whilst he was born in a gypsy wagon, he had a gap where he was settled and my dad was schooled and he was very good at it. My mum, bless her, was born in a gypsy wagon. She didn't have um, a settlement and my mum couldn't read A from B. So my mum and dad were two worlds apart in that field. Mm. But thankfully, I picked up this information from this kind gentleman, Jim Needle. I'd love for one of his family to come out and say that was my granddad or something because... You know, just even to, even for them to hear the word. Mm. So I feel so indebted and thanks. So. I couldn't imagine life now without reading. Yeah. I really couldn't. It must be difficult. It well, must be, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, exactly, yeah. What was your life like before you settled? Um, in terms of... Like what memories have you got from those young years? What were the, like the highlights? And Well, my, my, my years were spent in my dad's scrap metal truck with vast predominance and if, because I didn't school, of course, and ever... If it wasn't, it would be with my grandfather. So ra- his... is it Rag and Bone? Well, that, that's where we are. Historically, we were um, London totters, Rag and Bone men. Um, yeah. As whilst we were obviously travellers, Romanies, well, our settlement was always around London, but they were a typical London Rag and Bone men. Mm. And it just moved on to from horse and cart to metal dealing. So then buying and selling. Um, so my life was, was, uh, my dad was a gambling man. My dad was a drinking man, as most people were in British culture in those days. And so I saw all the characters at race meetings, betting shops, and I quickly, I felt like I grew before my time without realising I met some right characters. But then when we come back and, and play with our cousins, we'd play a variation of games. We didn't have, um, the... Toys that the kids have got today, uh, we made stuff. You know, we made things happen. So what, like? Well, we we, we would um, we we. I, I got into golf. So we would make golf holes and chipping putts. So when I was into that early, we would obviously have boxing gloves, but bare knuckle fights um, with the angry side of the. So so, so boxing was always there. Um, doing it without the gloves was always there, and we we do things. We pretend we were like um, we. <laughs> Oh, we like all oh, horses and horse racing. We pretend to jump jumps, a sandwich. We'd make all manner of things. You know, when it when it was when it was icy, we'd make our own ice rink. We just we just grabbed. We we made what we had, but it was, it was great times. Great we were times. Really, um, as you probably noticed, we were well fed and well loved, and they were just great times. Really, you know, fantastic. I imagine some Americans right now thinking, "What the hell is a rag and bone man?" Yeah, yeah. I, used get, man. I used to get so excited when you heard a rag and bone man coming around my neighbourhood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, how did yours go? It's like Eddie Scrap Metal. <laughs> 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 yeah, I see. Well, when I was at my friend's recently, there was one going around. Was there? Yeah. Describe so, what what it looked like. like well, the, I didn't see it. I could hear it. We were yeah, sat in yeah. a garden. It was a really hot summer's day. <laughs> and we just said Eddie Scrap Metal. Yeah. <laughs> like, was it like a cart or anything? I didn't know. It's well, how does a rag and bone man typically go around? Well, in the old days, it'd have been, you know, um, his horse and trolley, um, you know, so he'd be around and he would be, oh, my rag and bones be shouting out stuff like that. And um, any old lumber, rag and bones, a ring or the bell, anything yeah, to yeah, alert. Yeah. And obviously yeah. when they got the alertness, they come out and they knew what they were there for. Yeah. But my dad tells me the story how he's, my great grandfather, his grandfather would, um, he was a good horseman and a, a a typical um, rag and bone man, a totter, if you like. And uh, he said, oh, I like that jumper, grandfather, and I like those socks. And yeah, well, okay, you like that? Well, we'll take the ones off you have <laughs> um, because they would weigh them in for the weight of wool. And he said he was such a tough old sod that he, he come through two <laughs> world wars. He wouldn't give him a jumper. He said he had to take the one off the edge. Yeah, but <laughs> interesting stuff, eh? Yeah. So did you say that you were actually fighting before you settled? 
um, fighting as in like yeah, when as, kid, as, kids, as kids, yeah, as kids. Yeah, yeah. I, How does that start? Then at what age? Well, for me, <laughs> I, I had a cousin who he absolutely adored, loved fighting, and he used to whack me, <laughs> and um, I, I was the baby and petted and babied up a little bit for eight years, as I said, I was a baby. So initially, I'd be walking away crying, and he just loved fighting. He was a baby. He is what he enjoyed, so I didn't blame him for that. And um, on one occasion. I wanted to go out and play with my cousins who were all in the field. This is near Epsom. We had some settlement there on, on, on the site at Epsom. And we wanted to go out and play. And he went, I went for the door. And he went, yeah, you're going gonna, you're gonna to come back crying again, aren't you? And I said, not this time. I was so eager to get out and go and play with all my cousins. And um, I went out to play and my cousin went to throw the right-hander again. And I just went, dunk, bang, <laughs> have that one. And that normally deters them and stops them from beating you up. All it made was for a fantastic even fight. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately for me, I just had to have a, endure another four years with this tough, tough nutcase of a fight uh, that we were both big, heavy kids, the same age, same weight. For about four years, on a God-given day, he could knock me back off balance. On another God-given day, I could knock him off balance, but we just couldn't beat each other. We were perfectly evenly matched. So we could fight three, four times a week in the boxing gym at the Foley Boxing Club in Surrey, and, and we go back by day or night and do the same with duck gloves. And um, this continued in, until we eventually stopped. So fighting for me, um, it was there from a six-year-old. And uh, I remember moving across to West London, a site at Cranford, and I had a couple of fights there. And uh, my first ever paid fight, would you believe, I was probably about 10 now at this stage. Ten. Yeah, and I got my first pay, and and what had happened? We 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 stayed on a site at Cranford in the community school. There was a school, um, right at the back of our site, and some of my mates from the site would attend school in uniform, but I I didn't go to school. But I nipped through the through the field, and they set me up with a couple of fights with the tough lads at school. I remember one of them kicking me in the jaw, and he's about three years older. And I, I managed, I didn't win the fight, but I didn't lose the fight. But one of my first paid fight was in that community centre. They had a youth club in the evenings. And um, I remember this guy's name, Aiden, and he was a sort of 25-year-old brother, the older brother running the youth club. And I had some 10-year-old dispute with his brother, who was about maybe 11 or something, smaller than me, but a bit older, 11 or 12. And we had a little bit of a scuffle like this. And he went, right, you two. And he got chairs, and he made a square ring of chairs. He went, right, if you want to have a fight, you sort it out properly, go for it. Well, bear in mind I've been fighting this <laughs> this brutal cousin, yeah, <laughs> who loved fighting for four years. And then I've come across the other side of London, and I'm fighting this lad who probably maybe has not had too much of this experience. I'm a veteran. I've probably had hundreds of fights at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> and I quickly go into this poor lad and I dismantle him and do a job on him. But fairness to his brother, he intervened, rightfully so, stopped us, rubbed us both on the head, give me 50p piece. 50 pence. 50 pence each we had. And we got a drink and a sweet. Now I'm thinking, this West London place, in compared to Surrey, is a doddle. I'm get not only I'm getting paid <laughs> and I'm getting a sweet and I'm getting a drink, my opposition... <laughs> Is like that in comparison to that. <laughs> so that was my first ever paid fight. And mm -hmm. um, that sort of took me up to the edge of my boxing. My brother was uh, he's five years, two months older than me. He was a seasoned fighter around the country, a good leading amateur. And um, he just suddenly stopped out the blue. And I was then advertising for fights. I had about 15 or 20 what we call gym fights then. So there were boxing matches without results, and I went all around different various places, giving different ages and weights away, but I loved it and, and doing okay with it. And right on the edge for me to get carded up, a medical card is what they called it, for then, then you get a rightful fight. My brother stopped out of the blue, and it was at this very period of time where we settled. My dad was offered, a, my mum and dad were offered the house, and incidentally, it was right around the corner from my grandfather's yard, 200 yards away. So the boxing training had stopped, but what we were doing now was golf every day. So this is really fun now. We're golfing almost every day. So this is where my boxing stops and my golf kicks in at this point. And what age was that? So I'm now 10, 11, mm -hmm. and we get going nicely, and I always get emotional at this bit. 
this is the point when my grandfather dies playing golf with me so sorry but always when i talk about this stuff it's just like in fact of all days it was the 14th of november 1983 so we're talking 38 years ago to the very day oh. yeah to this very day oh, so it's, it's to this very day yeah it's meant oh, to be wow. the, in honor of him exactly yeah uh, so bless him yeah. um He's on my mind every day, but of all days, it's full, 38 years today, 1983. It fell on a Tuesday, playing around the golf, and this dreadful shock. Played 0-1, he made a little wager for me that I beat the locals. 0-1 wasn't so great, 0-2 was a bit better. And I played this beautiful golf shot, towered it over the trees, down on the flag, and I thought grandfather's going, oh, yeah, he's going to like that one. And... It was at that stage, I glanced to my right, and that was that was it. He had a massive heart attack. And um, If you was, can, can you explain the scene? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I hit this golf shot down the left side of the fairway. Uh, excuse me. <coughs> my grandfather did tell me it takes a man to cry, so I'm not worried about crying. He always told me that. And I just hit the ball down the left and was concentrating on getting the thing o over the tree. Oh, enough, quick enough, onto the green, and I'd done it. It's a beautiful shot down, and I, and I looked over. Initially, I didn't think it was my grandfather because I addressed him in a young, in my dad's clothing because it was cold. And um, when I say dressed him, I said my dad's cardigan. It was a Pierre Cardin cardigan. It was before my grandfather's dress era. So initially, when I looked over, it wasn't in his dress sense, if you like. So I wasn't alarmed. Only then... A split second, and I went, oh, shit. You got me? I had given him my dad's cardigan. So when I went to, to, to um, his, I quickly alerted aid and people there. When I eventually got the courage up to go to his side, As he had fallen, he had a complete boxer's cut. I don't know if it was an old one opened, but it was a lovely, neat, when I say lovely, neat cut, hard men don't worry about cuts on the eyes, right? No. They don't worry about that. That's just part and parcel. It was a lovely, neat boxer's cut. I don't know if it was an old one had opened as he fell, but he just looked so much like he was, I'd been hit with a right hander, and as he, but, but he, he was counted out, he wasn't getting up. Yeah, that was the scene. And he was, I knew, I knew he was dead. He, he died on arrival to the hospital. He was announced, but I knew he was gone, pretty much. And how did that affect you? <sighs> well, I, I'm a family man, you know. Um, it's me. It's my blood. It's me. It's, it runs right through me, you know, um... It will forever affect me. Of course. But I'm made of strong stuff. He was. I dust myself down. I don't cry about this. Double get emotional about it on a daily basis. But when you ask me to live the scene, I live it. Yeah. And, um, but I, I look at it in a way. He died prematurely at 65. I think it's a bit premature, but, um, I look at it now. If I got grandchildren, if one of my grandsons, I died watching them play golf, I'd say, right, bang on, son. That's a good way to go. But I, I would try to make 85. But if it's 65, that's my destiny. 55, so be it. So he went in a pleasant way. There's never no nice way to go. And, um, yeah, so it, it, it's affected me. But I, I've got all, all my strengths and characters all the good bits come from that guy. All the bad bits are my fault. <laughs> <laughs> my best mate died last year, Joe, and I believe the spirit of him lives on in me, and it sounds like it's the same thing with your grandfather. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Good. Is a traveller funeral different then from a UK traditional British person funeral? I, I wouldn't say we're all human beings. So we're all grief-stricken. Um we predominantly get buried, which has changed the face of that used to historically happen in mainstream, but now there's a lot of cremations. So I'd say slightly, we, we 
97% of our funerals will still be burials as opposed to that maybe a bit 50-50 in mainstream. So there's a little difference there, but we're still grief-stricken. We're human beings. We we show respect. I don't think there's any difference in that sense. They, they tend to have fairly big gatherings. Um, they like to see them off nicely. It's their last thing with, with big floral tributes. But I think beyond all that show, mate, we're just all hurting, aren't we, when this course, happens? Yeah. Definitely. And what was your grandfather's funeral like? Oh, massive. massive yeah? No, massive funeral. Yeah, fan fantastic send-off. I've got images somewhere in the book. You know, it looks like you look down, it looks like a state um, funeral. You, you probably see it there somewhere. Oh, look at that photo Green. of you. Black and blue. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Good that you've got pictures in your book. Yeah, it is in there somewhere, I'm fairly sure. You're wedded. Wow, well, these are great pictures, aren't they? Is that it? Where is it? Is it at the beginning? Oh, yes, there you go. Can you see the line Rhino's of... funeral makes the papers, 1983. Wow, yeah, there it is. Hundreds, Hundreds on, on it. the Gypsy King. Oh, that's fantastic, isn't it? So we had a proper parade... Yeah, he, I mean, it was a very, very tough, harsh winter, I remember, but he still had a fantastic Turn send off. And, 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 you know, before social media, this is stuff, you know, 1983, you couldn't jump on Facebook and tell somebody that something happened. Mm -mm. But to have hundreds and hundreds of people there, yeah, it just underlines it, I think. So the news spread round. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what was your life like then once you settled? then are you like pursuing the golf and the fighting more actively or are you going down one direction versus the other? Well, now, now I'm a golf champion. Are you a golf champion? <laughs> yeah, I'm getting to more emotional stuff. Well, my dad's now my best fan and my dad since passed, so I, I, I get a bit touchy on these areas. But I'm very supportive. Um, I make a, uh, a vow to my grandfather that I will be a golf professional and um, things are going swimmingly well. And um, I moved to a... Private golf club, very difficult for people like myself, unless you, because it's quite a, a well to do game, if you like. It was a, it's a, from a rich background, or should we say, uh, or, or who you know background, you know. So it was a bit of snobbery in the game, even in, the, in these days. We're talking almost 40 years ago, yeah. So for me to get in a private club was a bit of a deal, and I did get in a private club. So I went initially at the municipal course, and when I got to the private club, I started then to really. We had perfect practice facilities. We had two practice grounds. There were two European Tour players based there that would, would help me and look out for me. And I was just quickly coming to... My skills are really showing through. So I, I won like the, the Richmond Open. I won the London Junior Open, which was a big event. Uh, it was televised. Dennis Thatcher giving me the prize. Dennis Margaret's Thatcher. Margaret's husband then, the Prime yeah. Minister. Yeah. So we're talking about huge people. Yeah. It was a big event. BBC cameras were there. Announcing that I was a winner, I, I won uh, two course records to my name. Holy shit! I um I was a club champion. I've beaten a very very good player. The bloke that was the previous champion and won it nine years out of ten and, and lost the year in the final. We hadn't. So I was coming to this club and all of a sudden they got wind that I was a gypsy and the success um it bred resentment and they manufactured some complete and utter bullshit lies up on me and um. I got through out the club, and that was devastating for me. That was another devastating impact. And I feared that we'd do it because I could see a manufacturer. I, I had told my mate, Grant Harrison, who was a European tour player, he said, you're all right, Joe. I said, yeah. I said, uh, but, but I'm a bit nervous. He said, why is it? I said, I think they're going to throw me out of the club. So you had a gut feeling. Yeah, I just knew it. And he went, don't be silly. He said, you just finished tied first in the Grand Challenge Cup. You've a course record holder. You've just won here. You've won there. You're the club champion. You're the London Junior Open champion. Don't be silly. They won't throw you out. And I went into this meeting on the false accusations they had made. Yeah. Total false. Nothing at all to do with me. The dispute they actually manufactured was nothing to do with me anyway. It was actually to do with my dad. Right. So it should have been a, a situation between my dad and them. But they brought me in. And um, my worst fears were laid bare. Uh, they asked you to resign. I said, resign? What does that mean? I really didn't. I mean, I'm 15, maybe just on the edge of 16 now. I said July, so I was 15 stroke 16. <clears throat> and I actually didn't know what resignation meant. So talk That's... us through the manufacturing of the resignation, because you said something about your father's fault. Well, what had happened, I, I was at one of these events. These are some events. I think one about seven events that year. I went to a place in Basingstoke, Hampshire, won the Junior Open. So halfway round... Um, 
we have food for the players, part of your entry fee. So I'm playing with another couple of fellow juniors. My little brother, eight years my junior, is caddying. And me and the guys, the youngsters that were I'm playing with, other 15, 16 year olds, what we were at the time, we'd finished our sandwiches and we said to my dad and my brother, we don't want those, you have them. So principally, as far as we were concerned, we paid for the entry fee, the sandwiches or else. We decided to give them away. At the end, I went on to win the event. At the end of the afternoon, my dad was presented with a bill of £4.25. Wasn't a lot of money. Probably an expensive sandwich in them days, <laughs> but it wasn't a lot of money. Probably equivalent to 10 or or £12 pounds now. So, um, excuse me. Um, so my dad refused to pay for the sandwiches. He said they were given to me. And that was a dispute. And that's how he didn't, this club had reported to our club we refused to pay for sandwiches. So this is now a debate, a dispute, sorry, between my dad and the bar steward at Basingstoke Golf Club. Instead of it being left like that, they manufactured all manner of stories. Um, my older brother's speeding, in, speeding off in the car, my young brother's pushing over fruit machines. All oh, some total rubbish, complete and utter rubbish. None of this existed, none of it happened. But they decided, asked for my resignation from the golf club. All over a sandwich? Mm. Wow. They were just wanted to get you out there one way or the other, didn't they? Mm. But the interesting thing was, I had a sidekick, a friend called Andreas Kikidas, of Greek parents, a nice lad, a good friend of mine, good golfer. And um, when shortly after I'd been thrown out the club, Andreas and a policeman's son, who I don't know the name of, uh, the policeman's son had got called nicking out the pro shop. Well, Len Roberts says he had professional. When you're a golfer, he's your man. He's the governor in your... If you're a wannabe golfer, he's the man you look up to. They got caught thieving out of his pro shop. Whilst Andreas didn't thieve, he was aware of the theft. So he got a six-month suspension, I think, as did the policeman's son. He got a six-month suspension. And the then PGA ex-tour professional, Len Roberts, good golfer, gentleman, he was witness saying... Where's the justice? The gypsy boy that wouldn't take a tea too many from my shop, if he had, he'd let me know, gets kicked out for life over a sandwich dispute. The policeman's son comes nicking in my shop and he gets six months. And Len was a gentleman, but he was reported swearing. He said, where the fuck's the justice? So that just gives you some idea. So that impacted my golf career massively. Because now what you've got to... This is going to be probably difficult because I don't think either of you are golfers, are you? No. I used to go to putting... Um, <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. Or crazy golf. What, driving ranges. Driving ranges. Oh, right. I thought you were going to say crazy golf. I'm that, too. Yeah. I love a good driving range because you're just like, whack, 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 Are you any good at crazy whack. golf? Uh, probably crazy at it, really. <laughs> <laughs> I did have golf clubs yeah, when I was like a kid. That. My dad used to take me... Oh, right. golf oh well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you what you will miss and mm. your audience here globally, right? Some will get it mm. and some won't. But trust me, if you got kicked out of a private golf club, when you went to the next one, they say, Where will you remember it? Mm. Ah, and the, you needed a background check. So no different you. No different if you were going to get a job in the post office and your previous offence was stealing stamps. So you're not going to get the job, are you? So I then had to revert back to a public golf course and the practice facilities, the input of cash is not in them places. And before we knew it, my I give the golf almost a two-finger salute. Mm. I'm not a quitter, but I was in a dodgy little period of time. I didn't know how to handle what had happened to me, mm. as did my parents not. They weren't experienced in that field. And quickly before we knew it... Um. We got to an age where I then had all my knuckle fights uh, between the age of my, my, what I call my adult knuckle fights. I defended my family and my family only from the age of 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Now, I'm a boy, bear in mind, but all my opponents were adults. So what I call my adult knuckle fighting happened from when I was a teenager, from 15 to 19. I won these fights, even even a couple of them when I was still a, a golfer at Own Park at 15, 16. That, that's still in that time period. But I'd beaten a couple of seasoned professional fighters with mm. names and reputations. 
as a boy. Now, I'm not boasting. All I'm saying is I beat them. I'm not saying I'm Muhammad Ali. I'm not saying they are, but I've beaten them. And that then gets a reputation. I then started getting my ego massaged. Pats <laughs> on the back. Before we know it, it happened like a, a, a merry-go-round a million miles an hour. We was just involved with fights, and we were in a culture where the Cray film come out. The Goodfellas. So they're portraying villains. There's cool guys. You know, the Godfather. And before we knew it, it was stupid, stupid rubbish. And I can see it's total lot of shit now. But it was firms and violence and we need a front man for this job. And that's where then the criminal and the violence and all the crap that I don't enjoy now happened. I can't change it. But it happened. So my golf was on and break up on Skid Row. So um, I got off on a charge. Um, I got lucky on a, on a charge. I got off on a case. And my dad, I went home to see my dad. He gave me some own truths. And um, at just at a point in my life, one thing I will say to you, Sean, Jan, is... I might be fairly useless at most things, but I am a quick learner. <laughs> if I if I see something, I can learn something quick. And it all spun around, and I just was home with my mum and dad. It was amazing. On this occasion, there was, no, there was normally a house full, but on this occasion, it was just me, mum and dad. And this hard man, this youthful bloke that beat that pro fighter, this pro fighter, I was like a little boy listening to my dad. Mm-hmm defenseless no defense hands tied behind my back it all become apparent <sighs> how disappointed i made them and i thought nah sorry mate goodbye that life this life is down over my shoulder downwind left shoulder gone that life's going for me and it wasn't quite as easy as one two three I still had a few old cronies saying, come on, let's get a firm together. Let's go and do this. I went, no, I'm playing golf, mate. All right, oh, yeah, you're a coward. Call me what the fuck you like. Call me a coward if you like. Be what you want. I'm not going down, getting five or six, seven years. My dad offered me a chance to play golf. I got lucky. I was pointless. I wasn't a violent man in nature by as a kid. I wasn't violent. And I didn't. And it, it just all... Happened so quick. I was then moving forward. So my dad offered me an opportunity to play golf as a professional with a friend of mine, Alan Jarrett, who incidentally is from a minority golf professional because he's a black fella. So he too was a bit unusual in that field. It was a gypsy <laughs> and a black man going out to Sweden to become golf professionals. <laughs> and that's what we did. And okay, we turned up and we probably messed up a bit, but we both pursued, I pursued, and that was my career from the budding star that could land a ball on the six months with all the all the skill set, all the imagination. I was broken, nervous, fallen as a golfer. Do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. I had a friend once who was absolutely obsessed with signing up for things. In the old days, he actually had to use a pen and paper, but because it's only a click away, he ended up connected not just to magazines, the online versions, but just about every streaming service there was. I thought he was odd, but really, looking back on it, he was no exception. There's so many people like that. He got onto this Truebill app. 
He used it. And, well, he certainly saved himself a lot of money. It seemed to offer him the choice of getting out of all the stuff that he couldn't remember. He did quite well out of it. I uh, tried to convince him it was my idea. Truebill has over two million users and helped save them over a hundred million dollars. Like Matthew B., who says, In a matter of seconds, I saved $660 for the year on my direct TV bill, saved $120 for the year on my Sirius XM bill, and saved $840 a year on car insurance. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start cancelling today at Truebill.com. Slash Sean. Go right now, Truebill.com. Slash Sean. It could save you thousands. Thousands a year. Truebill.com. Slash Sean. But again, when you become a professional in those days, it's different now. You had to stay a professional or wait two years before you compete, could compete as an amateur. I stayed as a professional for... I stayed as a professional. I didn't do the amateur route back. And I was a laughing stock amongst professionals. I was aware of that. But something deep inside me wouldn't allow me to give up. I didn't know how to give up. I wasn't going to give up. I made a pledge. And I tidied up a few things, including my dress code. And I got my act together. And I started playing good golf. Better golf. And I started winning checks and making cuts. And I was no longer the laughing stock as a British golf professional. I was now a player. I had broken certain barriers. I could go on, you know, further down the line. But I had made achievements as a golf pro. And now I was respected as a golf pro. And then at that stage, it made me happy. Because I had this fulfilment from my grandfather. You know, um, yeah, so I got my playing rights on various tours. I know you're not golfers, but I got my... We went through qualifying schools. I, and I, I played on European tour events. I played on, on, on the European Challenge Tour events. I had number one playing card on the Euro Pro MasterCard Tour. I was a European father-son champion with, with my son. So I'd done my piece. I got all the... I didn't fulfill the dizzyites um, that maybe I was predicted as a kid. But I had a rough road. I had some people in there interfering with that, you know, putting barriers up. But I got over it. And as I say, I didn't fulfill my dream of playing in a major championship. I went to six final qualifiers, nearly made it, but I didn't. But I had a fantastic journey doing so. And um, my boxing kicked in when I was about 29 or 30. I often wondered what would happen had I pursued a boxing career. Because mm. I'd done enough of it, right, as a kid. And then I was in this sort of <laughs> dilemma as to where I go with the British Boxing Board of Control. I go unlicensed professional boxing. So with my age, 29, approaching 30, I decided I got more money offered as an unlicensed professional over two-minute rounds. Is that quite a late start, 29, 30, into the boxing It's not world. usually, but it is, it is really. But bear in mind, I wasn't from a complete standing start. I had a lot of... I knew what fighting was about from, from, a, from a little boy. So... Um, and that's where I pursued then my unlicensed professional boxing career, running parallel, believe it or not, with, with my golf career, which is quite unusual. <laughs> what do you think to Tiger Woods? Well, he's just awesome, isn't he? I mean, he's awesome? Uh, yeah, I mean, records records speak for themselves, don't they? He's, he's, he's the second most achieved player ever, and you know, arguably the greatest in some people's opinion, but absolutely awesome, yeah. And have you met him? Yeah, I have, actually. I've got oh, really? a good story on that one. Ooh. I like a good story. <laughs> <laughs> And check out the book in the description box. Yeah, 1998, um, I reached the final qualifying. So I went through the regional stage of a qualifying for the Open Championship, the Open Championship, the one where I had my dream. And um, things had changed a little bit then, but uh, from then. But then all the world leading players outside the top 50 had to qualify and they had to come over to the UK to qualify. So the qualifying was just outside of Liverpool Hillside. And the actual main venue next door was... Birkdale, where the Open Championship was being played. So they uh, notified all the competitors from Illside qualifying that your practice ground will be used as a car park because all the world's top players have left the Scottish Open and they'll be arriving on Sunday whilst we're playing Saturday, Sunday and Monday to qualify. So you will be sharing the practice ground with all the players that have already qualified. So 
there we go. We get escorted around. I mean, my caddy, my brother, John. And we're down the line and we're, we're practicing and we have Tiger Woods literally 10, 15 yards from me. You know, two, 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 two bays down on a grass range. We're hitting balls. My hero, Bernard Langer. So I'm about to hit this shot. My brother says, you better hit this one good brother. Your man's here. My, my golfing idol was Bernard Langer. Luckily enough, I did hit a good shot. But me and Tiger Woods are hitting golf balls. The wind was so strong. It was the only venue that wasn't called off of the other four qualifiers. The wind was so strong, we were like little boys hitting the golf ball hundreds of feet up in the air in front of you, and it was coming back to your feet almost. <laughs> wow. And so that was my experience with Tiger Woods. We were all <laughs> acknowledging and laughing all the way down the line. But he was we a nice bloke. Yeah. We didn't really w walk up and say, hi, Tiger. And Joe, he was, he was still a massive player in 98. I think he was still world number one or about to be in 1998. But we were all having a, a gimmick and a laugh and hitting the ball together on the Shame practice. the selfie stick <laughs> wasn't around then, you know. Yeah, and I've been trying to get the overhead <laughs> footage somewhere. It's got to be there somewhere. But uh, that was my nearest experience with Tiger. I've been in Brilliant. the same event, but... Um, I played in the same event the famous year when Justin Rose almost won the event. So it's all, all the same year. But that was that was a great memory. And my parents um, looked over and went, here, yeah, look, he's next to his man, Langer. He's been waiting for this moment, you know. And that was another really hard hit and emotional, beautiful time for me. But that was probably one of my highlights as a professional, yeah. Oh, fantastic. And I nearly qualified. I, I, I just missed by a few shots that year. And I played with a Ryder Cup player and come back and out my head eye. I played with Pierre Folk from Sweden. And, um, yeah, so that was a fantastic week. I bet you were shitting yourself playing in front of the Tiger oh. that you did fuck up. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely. absolutely. Like, people don't understand, you yeah. know, walk, walking down into a, a, a gypsy campsite for a fight, you're shitting yourself because you've got to do the business and it's a dangerous sport. But it's not as nerve-wracking with 100 people over and around the first tee and you're playing with a Ryder Cup player, trust me, no <laughs> near as, wow. you know, nerves jangling, different type of control, you mm. know. Um, but that's why we do it. That's why I love both my sports. Yeah. Well done. So earlier on then, you mentioned how you just like got through a situation with the law. What, what was your first brush with the law? Well, there's no good crime, is there? But I call it good old-fashioned honest cr crime, really. But when I say good old-fashioned honest crime... We didn't take it to residential homes. It was, it was. Um, I'm not glorifying it, and I'm not saying it's right, but it's like factory robberies and and stuff like this. And of course, violent encounters with other firms, and we called it firms. What a load of rubbish it was! <laughs> we were all young boys and men, you know. Try, had nothing better to do to try and prove that we had a tougher firm than that one. What mindless crap that was! If any young lads are listening, don't go down that road, son. Please, that was. And that's a load of rubbish. Mm. But we didn't know any different then, and I do now. So please don't go down the bumpy road I did. Keep on the smooth one. So what were the lads like who befriended back then? Well, it was, it was some in some, 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 some were good lads and some were staunch lads. And But what, what you had, you, you see some people would want you to commit crimes or, or be a front man, and they weren't willing to do it themselves, and that was the reason for backing out. Mm. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm willing to go and get, if it goes wrong, a five, six, seven, eight years, knowing that, and they don't want to do that. They want to, they want to hang on to your clan or hang on to your shirt tails, but they don't want to go the full hog. And or if you pulled off a bit of crime, I'd, I'd go and spend mine in a restaurant and let us know we had it all. You know, bottle of champagne, getting me and that. They pull it off and keep it. And there's things like that I got tired of. I think I just. You know, I'd seen it, I'd done it, and it, it didn't impress me. I had no, nobody to advise. I had to learn myself. But some of them are good lads and are still my mates. Some are brilliant lads. And it's all learning curve as well, bear in mind. But, um, yeah, that, that's what really was... When I saw seasoned, supposedly ardent men with reputations, when you really got to know them, they wouldn't just go that fog and commit that crime or have a fight with that person. And you thought, hold on, you're just being mugged off here, mate, aren't you? You're just being led here for a mug. But my dad could see that easily, but I couldn't. You know what I mean? And I had to take the knocks and bruises and the bumpy journey. But I was very lucky because I, I didn't get a big stretch of prison, you know. I was lucky, thank God. How did you get caught? 
well, because <laughs> I didn't get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> I got caught up the scene. At the scene. At the scene, trying to do oh, something. Sure. Well, you know what it's like. You, you, you don't get away with crime. Caught, you caught get at caught. the scene? You don't get away with crime because you get caught. That's Were there dogs? Sorry? Were the, what, the police turned up? Yeah, I mean, just variation, yeah. You, you, as I say, you um, caught in the act almost. Or so someone had called it in? Mm. No, yeah, it's always, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's always a tip off or a, or a snitch somewhere. But you know, in fairness, mm. the, the snitch might be a straight nine to five goer. I don't mind. I don't mind. I don't call people grasses who are nine to five. They they are law abiding citizens. They need the law. Not a problem with that. The only disappointment I get with snitching is when people within, you know, <laughs> tip offs and whatever. You know, it's a different. Don't don't never hold it, hold anything against a nine to five or ringing the police. That's their business. You know, it's what they do. But when you're in the criminal world. Mm-hmm. And um, and there's a few of them lurking around, isn't there? Anyway, I don't want to talk about that. Moving how, on. Yeah. How old? How old were you then when the cops grabbed you? Well, it was in that period from when uh, that that sort of period after my golf, the sort of eighteen, nineteen, twenty year old. And, and like, did you have to go down to the police station and all that stuff? Yeah, we done a little bit on remand. We probably nicked, yeah, of course, we yeah. nicked, nicked a few times. And did that make you think twice about doing that stuff, or did it at that age we were invincible? Well, at the end of the day, we went in. If we got a three or a four or a five, it's we we knew what we were doing. We went to do it. Mm. You know, I knew that. I knew that if you if, if you're committing a, a, a robbery of a factory of underground of a gear or something, you get nicked. You know, you're going to go to prison, don't you? Yeah, I knew that before I put my overalls on. Yeah, yeah. So if you got nicked, if you got off with it, great. Mm-hmm. But if you got nicked, you 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 knew what you were facing. That's you know, I wasn't that silly. I was naive, but I knew if I got nicked, there was going to be a penalty to pay. Yeah. Mm. When I got nicked, my best mate was with me and a lot of other fellas were with me. So, I, you know, I knew people um, in the system. So when you were in the system, was there a lot of travellers, uh, people, like co-defendants in there with you, like it was in my case? or No, it was a, a couple of times. I think it was it was mixed. Some times I've been nicked, a couple of times with travelling boys, a couple of times with non-travelling boys. But... Um, yeah, but they, then the old bill, they mark your card, don't they, once you start getting nicked? Yeah. And that's mm. the other thing. Yeah. And um, especially then when I got nicked, I was up the road. I was away from London. I was up the road a bit, and it was a smaller area, and they sort of start marking your card. Mm. You know what I mean? And they think they come back, search my trailer, and find the bottle of carver and gloves. And they just think you're then a serious, serious criminal. And I mm. weren't really. I was just a criminal. But they yeah. think you're serious. And all of a sudden, everywhere you move, uh, you're under surveillance. And it was all that stuff. That, that sort of, you know, because I like to think I weren't an idiot. There's no point. Well, whilst I knew if I got three or four years in prison, but still nothing glorified. It ain't clever about going in there. There's clever men in prison, but it ain't clever about going in prison. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. So like, yeah, that, that's how it sort of worked for me. And but but coming back to golf, it's been a it's been a such a it's been a lifesaver for me because you meet so many nice people. Well, then suddenly instead of plotting. Meeting in a pub at eleven o'clock, having a, a light hour, <laughs> and plotting the next move. Mm-hmm. We're meeting for breakfast, playing around the golf, then having a beer, seeing how we can get better. It's a totally different group of people. And uh, what I've learned to, what I've what I've I've learned, live to learn, as these nice people, yeah, come from so many fantastic different backgrounds, and that's what I love about people. You know, they come from so many different backgrounds. You don't have to be, this is a message for the youngsters, you don't have to have an hard, tough dad. Yeah, you don't have to have scars on your face to be a nice bloke. <laughs> you know, there's so many nice people out there. You get to meet them. And it could be quite a quiet bloke in the corner. And you might say, well, he's a bit shy, maybe not a nice person. He's just a little bit shy. You get to know him as a fantastic, beautiful person underneath that. That's what I've learned in life. And golf's learnt me so much to meet some fantastic people. And to conduct herself, even down to proper dress code and tuck your shirt in and wear a collar and wear some trousers and some shoes. Those little things, shake hands, take an off at the end of the round. They're priceless. They're little, they might be little minnow things in the scheme of things, but I'll tell you what, they go a long way, mate. Go a long way, those little things, for me to do anyway. I think what's so inspirational about you, Joe, is you've got this winner mentality so, like, you succeeded at the fighting, mm. you succeeded at the golf, you're a successful author. Would you say that it seems like the fight mentality was laid down first? Would you say that winning the fight mentality transferred over to the golf 
and the psychology of being a successful author is is the parallels there well i think whilst both from my mum and dad's side i come from fighting a breeder family with lots of professionals and from both sides and top knuckle fighters there may have been some genetics there maybe possibly but i think it was more like our way of life my mum got up in the morning as did my dad and they didn't know if they had two bob ahead of them there was no securities right no social securities no handouts their way was they just got to get up today and they got to go and make a living and I think that was just so, from a young age, that was, we just found a way. we we'll go and make a living. And if you don't hurt people along the way, you haven't done too bad. So my mum would sell Lucky Ever, Charms, read their hand, tell them nice things they wanted to hear. She never so palm them. reading. Palm reading, yeah. I don't know if she could read them or not, <laughs> but she used to look at people's hand and get money for it. But she told people nice things. She didn't hurt nobody along the way. As my dad, he honestly dealt in his scrap metal. He didn't thieve his scrap metal. He honestly dealt in it. And they were just versatile characters. They'd get up and then we could be travelling around different parts of the country where my dad knew nobody. But he would go and find some factories to have a deal and a trade. As would my mum are go in front of people she'd never met before, present herself, both come home with food on the table. And I think that instalment is we'd find a way I think seriously now what I'm saying, I don't mean to sound boastful. Romany travellers, to the people I know, my family, are the hardest working people I've ever known. If they go out an opportunity, now the opportunity has grown for them. If they got an opportunity, you trust me, they'll go out and work and take it. Mm. There'll be none of this, excuse me mate, I'm, I can't make Friday because I'm fishing. Or These guys will be there yesterday morning. Yeah to do some work if the opportunity come their way. And now it's presented, the world is a smaller place, if you like now, with the social media's activities and the doors are open and the settlement. So my advice to them young lads is, again, just go and get a career. There's every opp opportunity there now. I mean, I'll give you an example. My niece is a school teacher and she's heading to be an ed teacher. My mum's cousin is a surgeon, a uh, hip surgeon. So we have come places. We've got opportunities. And this, th this is... It's getting better for us. Uh, it's a nice opportunity for mainstream in Romanies to knock down some barriers. Definitely. Share our culture. Come together in love because we, we don't travel much anymore. We, we are settlement. So there's every opportunity we could, yes, okay, we could be doing your, your landscape garden. But there's every opportunity now with settlement and be taxpayers, the people you know you see in your community. So there's every opportunity now we can come together more. And I'd like to see that because... There's been two standoff groups, mainstreaming ourselves. What is this murky world behind? Mm. And it's not that different. So what do you think of that programme, Big Fat Gypsy Wedding? It's, on quite, it's quite popular. Big Fat Gypsy oh, Wedding. I think it's yeah. a load of rubbish for me. I wouldn't watch it. Really? I've seen, I've, I've seen it enough to know that it's rubbish. They got really mixed reviews, quite bad, some of them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, to me, it's just a load of rubbish. It was basically over the traveller communities, uh, women, obviously women and men get married and they film it and they just, it's a bit extreme. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, they just picked out footage that suited them. I don't think you've done, mm. I don't think you've done justice. Clickbaiting. Clickbaiting. Yeah, I don't yeah. think you've done justice. Um, so you said like there's the, like the mainstream then, so... Discrimination over the years? Did you have to suffer discrimination? Yeah, but it was a barrier. Um, again, my, my parents told me, you will get called names. You, this will happen to you. But right over it. It won't break your bones. It's names. You will have this. So I was ardent to the what fact. What sort of names? Well, we want to keep them out. <laughs> oh, we might have to keep them out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't repeat the names. <laughs> well, we're commonly known as and I, again I think pro, Time stamp. <laughs> I, I think pro rata we're the cleanest people on earth I know we're clean I know we go out of our way to be clean there might be exceptions as in all people but that's just one typical name because we didn't, didn't have the facilities of running water they didn't think we'd wash well that wasn't the case we got a nice clean wash from red to toe but I mean, just, just one of many names um, I've seen my dad point blank refuse to drink in the pub my dad was a nice nice big 
big looking, strong looking man. Lovely man, my dad. Refused point blank. Don't serve travellers in here, mate. Really? Yeah, yeah. Is that still going on? Is that? Oh, mate, very ago? much so. Is it? Very much so. I promise you faithfully, a lot more than you think. Mm. They now have to do it politically correct. So they make another. Now, I mean, recently we were asked for ID. I'm mean, in the pub with my son who's 26. The other one's 28. Another guy who had his ID who was like 21. He had his ID with us. We need ID. It's just a polite way of saying, I said, mate, this, this bloke's 28. He actually looks 38, doesn't he? He doesn't look 28. Mm. We need ID. It's a polite way of saying we're not serving you. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when you was a kid then, if people said these names to you, um, you'd already been warned by your parents, but it must have like shocked you a little bit to be discriminated against, perhaps. No, it didn't shock us to say we were warned. You were because you were warned. Did you get yeah, bullied? Yeah. No, we, well, I never went to school, but yeah. we, we would probably get bullied in another way. Yeah. But in the nicest way, children are bullies that they don't mean to be. They're children are children. You know, I, I'm not saying all children are bullies, but a lot of children are bullies. So uh, looking back on it, it's, but I'll, I'll give you an example. I run a kiddies football team back in the day. Right, and um, all of our players were white except from one one kid. I think we had maybe two black players, one mixed race, one black player. So you can clearly see the difference of an ethnic minority if a kid's black, but you wouldn't know if they're white. We had then a, a mixed group of white players that were Romanies and and gorgeous mainstream. The kids got on the pitch. Are oh, you kidding? So the kids addition out to our team, and I don't they. That's been installed not by the kids, it's been installed by the managers and the players and the parents. Because the kids wouldn't know another white kid from another white kid. They wouldn't know which one's a Romany and which one's not. Mm. They go to the same school to speak the same accent, right? So it, you know, it's, it's, this is, uh, it's, it's been going on a long time. And we're not too bitter about it, but we are one of the very last few minorities. We're the biggest ethnic minority in Europe, but we're the last standing one that seems it okay to take it on the chin when all other ethnic minorities are jumping on their eye hooks and standing ground. And I'm not going to speak here, stand ground in an heavy way. I'm just saying it's time to break down barriers and let us, we got work to do as well. Our mainstream's got work to do. And I would really, in my lifetime, for the bit I've got left, please God, another 20, 30, 40 I would like to to see some of those barriers knocked down and bridges built. I really would because I've got so many lovely friends that are gorgeous and I've got so many lovely friends that are Romanies and they're all humans. They're all people. I go in my wonderful church. I look around. I see some of my friends over there of different backgrounds. Some of my friends that are black and we're all one. Yeah. I don't do the colour, creed, background crap. I do good guy, bad guy stuff. You know what I mean? That's me. So and it's and it's my family because you know we that's the way we were everybody was equal and I would like to knock those 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 barriers down in all honesty even if I could only knock a couple down I ain't gonna change the world probably you know maybe Tyson Fury is a big loud man and a big strong man maybe his voice would be a bit stronger maybe he could get it Let's over get but we it. could we could knock them down between us possibly. What stories have you got from your fighting days like who were your hardest opponents what kind of injuries did you get any? Sustain any injuries, the difficult moments fighting people, or well, in boxing terms, they're probably probably tougher in in sparring, really, because I fought a lot of sparred with a lot of champions. Um, I just broken bones in your hands and stuff in the knuckle fights. They were more painful than the right. facial than the facial. Um, How many bones have you broken? Oh, probably five or six in my hands, probably. You know, like you use, a, you knock a knuckle up that's broken and knocked away, and you knock this this joint up here, and that's knocked away and broke away, and and chips on your bones. But they they probably hurt as much as the facial punches, in all honesty, probably more, much more actually. But you know, you you wouldn't know with the boxing, you've had thousands and thousands of rounds. Very often, the punch that hurts, it could be the bloke where you're not warmed up, you don't really know him, you've dropped your guard down a bit, you ain't seen the punch coming, and that could hurt. Uh, more than if you're sparring with a European champion who you're then very vigilant of or you know is aware of is a really good fighter. So you can't really tell where you get these knocks and injuries from. You just get them. And, you know, and um, I, I always like to speak highly of my opponents because I, even if I beat an opponent, 
it takes two men's heart to make a fight. If somebody had a knuckle fight with me, his heart is exactly the same as mine. He's going in with me. He's doing the same job. So I never, ever speak ill of my opponents. I believe that boxing, good boxers have a really tough life. Bad boxers have an even tougher life. So I respect all the guys from world number 400 up to the world number one. So how do you correctly throw a right hook? <laughs> a right hook? Yeah. Oh, it's a good question because a right hook, it's it's uh, it's quite an unusual punch for um, an orthodox fighter, but you've got to be, you've got, you've got to have your balance in the right place, Jan. So if you're off balance, you shouldn't be throwing a right hook. So you've got to be... So what should I be throwing? So I'm getting get to ring. You're going yeah. to get up and get instructed. You know, you've got to be sat into your right side. It's no good being balanced into your left side if you're going to throw a right hook. So okay. you need a, a little bit of bend in your knees, yeah? yeah? A little bit of bend in your knees. You need to be on your right side. See, I you and then you can almost, almost um, throw a straight punch. We need to hook your arm. So instead of it travelling in that direction, it'll go boop, and a bit of shoulder. Bit so a little shoulder. bit of knee, little bit of knee, shoulder, and round the corner it goes. Wow, that's it. That's not bad. That's a pretty. That's that's that way. That way. That way. That's, that that's way. in between a hook and a straight. That's a very good effort. I think we could maybe make a fight with you just yet. <laughs> Definitely, I'm up for that. Did you have signature moves or like preferred punches that you like to? Catch someone out with a secret move. No, I mean like um, one thing I've always been vigilant of, and I was told really, really from my family. I come from a family fighting family, as I've already expressed. Do not ever, ever be boastful of your fight, and it's a big taboo amongst real Romany men. It's a big taboo. You don't boast about you're any good. So I'm standing here, sitting here, telling you guys I've known Muhammad Ali. I just done what I did. In front of me, I survived. If I could win a fight without hurting somebody, I would do that as well. I had no intention of hurting somebody. I also had myself to think of. So if I could win a fight with a couple of gears in hand, I was quite noted for that. I wasn't interested in hurting anybody. I didn't have eight in my heart, body, naturally, and I thank God for that and my parents. So you had fighters like Mike Tyson probably would want to hurt you, yeah? He probably would want to hurt you. Yeah, maybe Lenny McLean, he probably would want to hurt you. But not this gypsy lad. I didn't I just wanted to win my fight and get my own backside out of it in one piece. That's all I was interested in. Not what interested is... in pleasing crowds, others, just getting a thing called a W going home safely. Wow. So what was sorry, I've completely lost the track of what then? Time stamp. <laughs> God, I had really good. Um, what what was <laughs> right. the most difficult fight you had? Most difficult fight I had. Good question. Um, probably dragging myself from depths of despair as a golfer and getting myself back into world rank contention, from being the worst UK golf professional ever of my time to being a world rank professional, and that's probably the hardest fight I ever had. And why were you in the depths of despair at that point of your life? Why? Mm -hmm. Well, because I, I'd um, not practiced my skills. I'd shunned a life of crap behind me, and I was a broken man as a golfer. But I still had some. I had a. Uh, I had a locker there, and inside the locker was some ability. But I lost the key, so I had to go and find it. I searched for three, four, five years of really hard work. And what I am proud of myself is that when I got my form back, I worked really hard. The gypsy lad who was almost last every week would be seen to be working harder than everybody else. That makes me proud. Those things. Doing 10 hour days on a golf course, practicing. No matter what the weather is, it's practicing, working. Possibly working too hard, but I don't think you can work too hard. Probably if I could have turned the clock back, I wouldn't have worked as hard. I'd probably try and too hard to get good. But when I look back on it, you can't work too hard, can you? Because when you get the fruits, you know, of success, then they're all worth it tenfold. Makes it taste a lot better. So what did you prefer, honestly, boxing or golf, if you could only choose one? It's a very good question. Um, and I just, only just favour golf. Only just? Okay. Yeah, and I, m my sons all play golf and they all box. And I never push them to do either sport. If I had a preference of a career for them, I would choose golf. Um, I just think it's got a longer lifespan 
But bear in mind, you, you meet some lovely, lovely people in boxing. And it's the nice, the hard men are normally the gentlemen of life. And the real hard men. Now, we, we talked about the pretend hard men. Now you've got the real hard men. And with vice predominance, they are lovely, lovely people. They're soft art. So they're nice people in boxing. But all in all, I'd probably just edge with the golf. So who have you met through boxing, these hard men? Well, I've met numerous of champions and... and uh, over the years, you know, so, you know, um, numerous, hundreds, hundreds of champions, you know. I remember Terry Spinks as a, as a friend of mine, a little 1956, our first Olympic gold medalist. I was friends with the Finnegan Brothers gold medalist. Um, my uncle Johnny Frankham uh, was a British champion. Um, and, uh, you know, some of my sparring partners were champions. And and uh, John Conti, we've done a bit of work together on, on, on a golf show, so he's a champion of the world. So, yeah, yeah so I've met loads. It just goes on and on. But uh, very nice people. All those guys I mentioned are just tough, tough, hard men. You know, and um, another guy, um, I, I actually, I would like to take a small opportunity to, to remember him. The legendary Les Stevens was a friend of mine, and I, because of all the COVID and the lockdown, sadly died through COVID. So I'd like to take this opportunity to his family um, to remember him as a legend and, and a gentleman because I didn't get wind of his funeral with all the lockdown and whatnot. So I'd just like to take that. Probably he was a, he was a go, gentleman, there was nice man. Numbers, no, it was, there, it was so. all, exactly. It was all upside down. But as a boxer, many people paid their own tribute and I haven't had a chance. So hopefully this is a small way of saying, God bless you, Les, and your family, lovely man. Mm. Yeah, good man. Where do you get your determination and perseverance from? I think um, if you know my family, you know they were determined people. They were sportsmen. They were just determined. They determined to compete at anything. But as back to what we said, um, versatility. We had to be versatile. You know, um, we go out there, get a living. Um, just my upbringing, I think. I think it was my, my, my upbringing, my, my family are determined characters. You know, um, not me, but some of my families are, have been noted to fight for two hours in bloody wars and won't, won't give in and continue, you know, continue in that. I don't want to talk about those names on camera, but it's, it's, it's in my genes somewhere. And I'm a nice guy, bear in mind. I'm not, a, I'm not really a fighting man. That's just a phrase I went through. I'm a, a lover. Love and not a fighter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something lurking there. Seriously, there's something lurking there in the background that makes me determined. And I don't know what it is. Don't ask me to go and find it because I don't know. It's just there. <laughs> I know it's there, but I can't find it. You've either got it or you haven't, I think. Well, but also we wake up different days. I mean, especially in the sport of golf, we wake up days where it's very difficult because um, that's a tough sport in itself. But other than, and we... We get our God-given days where it's meant to be our day. You know, we have a good day at the office and that's where my little achievements come with the golf. But I think determination is having the perseverance, having being knocked down, being knocked down, being knocked down, or, or you know, as a golfer, having 10, 12 bad weeks, but you're trying harder. You're actually practicing harder on a bad run than you're on a good run. I always had that ability. Most people give up when things are bad. For me, when things are bad, I work harder at it. Mm. That's my. That's probably my gift, and that's in business. If my business, if my my, my my business is going well, I might put a nice suit on and watch and go racing or something, <laughs> have a day off. If my business is going bad, things are struggling, I work harder than any of my staff put together. So that's just my character. When when the going gets tough, you've got to get tougher. So you've got some lovely family photos in here, saying you're a family man. Is that your children? That's three of my children, I believe. That's my baby. That's Erin, Rhyma. That should be four of my children, actually. Can I take a peek? Oh, yeah, of course. My mince pies ain't what they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's four of my children, Chris and, and, and my niece. I've since added, uh, me and my beautiful wife have added to the addition since How then. many have you got? <laughs> we got five. Five children. Yeah, we, and we raised my wife's cousin from a young age. He's sadly lost his mother and his dad mm. done a long prison sentence who's since passed on so we brought him up so we really we have six so how old were you when you had your children <sighs> i'd have been 24 my wife is 21 maybe i think yeah we married at 18 and 21 respectively a couple of years after something like that yeah yeah 
What was that like? Bare, wait, were you bare knuckle boxing at that point or pro golfing when you had I was pro kids? golfing at this stage. At this and, stage? Yeah, and then later my boxing career comes in again later, yeah. What was but, it like having a young child being a pro golfer? Well, I had a very supportive wife. Yeah. Um, and she she supported me because it, it was a dream. It wasn't so much, I'm going to put, I, I, I never done golf. I, I, for five or six years, I was a full-time professional teaching, selling stuff. But for me, I had to, um, I had other jobs to support my dream. You remember um, when I come back, I said early in the interview that my grandfather, I pledged a promise and I'll keep promises if my health and strength are up. If I said I'll do something for you, provided I'm alive and around, I'll do it. That's me. If something unforeseen happens, of course I can't go through that promise, but I do keep my promises. If I say I'm going to do something, I'll do it. And um, that's what I did. So my wife could see my dream. And she's been a beautiful, lovely wife. She's been very supportive of me. You've got a photo of her. And I'm here. lucky. Yeah. Yeah. She's so um, on your wedding day. Yeah. <laughs> that is some hairdo. You've got yeah. a mullet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's brilliant. Wow. I love yeah, it. Lovely photo. Yeah, I used to have a bit of Barnet Fair in them days. <laughs> <laughs> Big, thick, blonde hair. Yeah. Back wow. in the day. And uh, my nickname is Joe Bugner, and they thought it was from the blonde curly hair, but that wasn't the case. <laughs> no. Back in the day, I was nicknamed Joe Bugner from 1971 when Joe Bugner was the heavyweight champion of Europe. <sighs> mm. My wow. uncle Neville said, as our Joe Bugner, and that name stuck with me forever. But there was an uncanny likeness with the blonde curly hair for a while. But it's incidentally my boxing name, Joe Bugner Smith. Yeah. But you're very envious. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a chapter in here called Dicing with Death. Mm. Is that a story we've we've not touched on today, or is that? Um, well, they've all got headlines to the chapters. Dicing with yeah. Death, I can't. Yeah. Um, I'm aware of all the chapters, and to you enlighten an incident, I, I Do you want me to read a couple of paragraphs? Nearly 100 grand in my bin for that piece of work and for the life of... Me, I cannot say where it went. Oh. <laughs> Blew a hundred grand. Yeah, there were funny. five other people involved. Oh no, five other people to pay, and there were other expenses unincurred yet. <laughs> right. Yet I was still left with a lump of dosh that could have bought me a flat, but instead slid slid through my fingers <laughs> like a bar of soap. Yeah, yeah, there you are. Just like had a bit, but didn't couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> But you know the pound note sign. That's another thing with life's maturity. I just that's um, way overrated. The pound note sign, isn't it? The love, that's not and, the meaning of life. No, <laughs> love and happiness is so much, so much more precious. So going back to your darker days, knowing what you know now, what would you say to your younger self? What advice would you give? Uh, knowing what I know now, I would have probably sent me down to Basingstoke Golf Club and told these people you're ludicrous idiots what are it's you not doing not far from here we can come yeah, down. you're ludicrous <laughs> idiots without foul language without any pressure without any physical contact verbally would have sorted that situation out and sent myself on the path of being the golf professional the champion that I was tipped to be without doubt but but had I now gone on tour I'd Probably I may have met some other lady, but I wouldn't have met my beautiful wife. So I now got my beautiful wife, my journey's mapped out, and here I am telling the story. So it's all done for a reason, and um, yeah, this is done for a reason. Now here's a bloke that could be much, much worse off in life. I'm not getting too bitter about a couple of idiots done this to me. It hurt me at the time. I was an impact, but look at me now. I've still got my looks intact. <laughs> <laughs> I have a beautiful wife, joking aside. Um, I have an okay lifestyle. We can support a car, a couple of holidays a year, or as much food and drink as we want, relatively speaking. I feel super, super rich, super, super happy. Very, very fortunate. I feel very blessed, thank the good Lord, that my journeys work this way. Of course, I hurt people along the way unintentionally. Never went out intentionally to hurt anybody. These things happened. My good Lord has got to forgive me for that. If people want to forgive me, they can. But I never intended, I never had in my heart to go and intentionally hurt somebody. Paths got crossed this young man. He tried to hurt me, ended up hurting him, all that crap. 
but I wouldn't change a thing. Um, I wouldn't change a thing other than the fact I can't change what I would like to have changed anyway. And I'm very, very happy sitting here talking to you people. I feel very, very oh, blessed. Thanks. Oh, we feel blessed. <laughs> what's the, looking back then, what's like the happiest, proudest moments of your life? Mm. Keeping up the high. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping up the high. I mean, it's always a lovely thing when your children are born, but I've got to really confess, I only really enjoy my children. When they, I mean, I just get this right. My wife would probably kill me. Right? <laughs> yeah. But I love them when they they start running around and I really start to, you know, you spend time, you're bonded, obviously. You, you, they're a one-year-old, you haven't, a one-day-old, you haven't bonded with them. Four-year-old, you've bonded with them. So there's an obvious thing there. But... um. So there's always an obvious eye about having your children, but watching them grow is a fantastic thing, and my grandchildren. But my real eye, I was in when I won the European Father Son Championship. I remember it like yesterday. My father was such a good supporter of me and my mum. I was really lucky. So I say I keep going on about this, but I feel, I'm sure most people out there got good parents. Sadly, not all. But I was really lucky. I had I and good parents, and they never give up on me when my form was down. They continued to support me. And um, it's somewhere on YouTube. I went absolutely nutty when my son sunk the final putt to win the European Father Son Championship. <laughs> we beat the US champions. And my dad was in fear of flying. So he was old school. He wouldn't fly. So we were out there and picking up the phone. Oh, mate. What a buzz. <laughs> I ring in my dad. I said, Dad, yeah. Yeah. Uh, your son and grandson um, is a little bit different now. He said, why is that? I said, we're champions of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great, great thing. It was <sighs> his emotion on the end of the phone. My emotion there, yeah, why not cry? Let's love it. We didn't, I don't drink before I played. We didn't drink the champagne. I drank a, a complete bottle of champagne on the last green. <laughs> we drunk, we nearly missed our flight. <laughs> We drunk the hotel, the hotel give up trying to get us out the bar, just stayed behind. It was a great, great eye. We returned in a drunken hangover, but even that couldn't dampen the mood. It was the greatest moment, um, one of the greatest moments of my life, yeah. Wow. Fantastic. Wow. And what do you say to the young people then that are tempted into this life of crime? And I think I heard you on another interview talking about, like, even in a pub, you know, you can hit someone and they could just fall over and die. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course, yeah. It's yeah. Please, lads. I mean, I I plead with you in the nicest way. Anybody listening here, just don't go down that violent stuff. There's lots of good guys, role models out there. Don't go down this violent road because it's just going to end in misery. And I am very, very lucky. There's so many guys doing 17, 18 years, or even dead. When you go into a violent altercation, who's to say I'm going to throw the right hander first? Yeah, who's to say that? somebody's got something in their pocket they might use that before you can throw your right hander and there's no real winners your parents be on this your family there's there's, there's, there's a life of misery girlfriend just please refrain from going down this violent road you can do it i'm a christian i love my jesus christ but you don't need to go to church but you can um the good lord's there to listen to you and people are there to listen to you and it's not always as it seems i'm not going to beat on about um religion to you guys i'm going to beat on about life all the knowledge you need is actually in the bible if you only just read it and that 90 think nine percent of british law is made up from the bible or it certainly was it may have changed a fraction now so you know this, this is by law all the common sense factors are there but grab an old uncle or a friend who's Somebody you look up to, they'll give you some sound advice. And it's down to us middle-aged guys to tell the young guys. But trust me, it's not a cool thing. It's rubbish. It doesn't make me a nice man by breaking somebody's face. That does not make me a better man in any stretch of the imagination. And neither would it make any of you guys any better by breaking my face. It's not. It's get away from this ego stuff. Go grab yourself a nice girlfriend in a career and share the nice things in life with your mates. Be the best you can be. Find your sport. Find your career. That's my advice. Please don't go down that road. And what made you want to write the book? Well, um, the book was... Uh, I had a book out, Gypsy Joe, in 2009, and it was voted Sports Book of the Year by The Observer. 
Tiger Woods was in second spot, would you believe? You touched on Tiger <laughs> earlier. And Lewis Hamilton <laughs> plodded around in third. Plodded <laughs> around. <Yeah. laughs> um, so it had great reviews, but we launched it during the World Recession, 2008-9. Yeah, so, I mean, people, 15 quid for a book or whatever it was. That is an expense. Um, it, was, it was an expense people couldn't afford. Credit so it didn't do very well in the sales. And um, the publisher and co-author, um, Martin Knight, they're really good friends. Yeah. And um, have I said that right? Co-author, joint author? Um, Martin Knight. It's coming up. It's yeah. your name. Yeah, okay. yeah it's not co. It's joint, joint author. He helped me up to, um, uh, with a few bits. And he, he says in the book, and was it primarily my story? He, he put a couple of bits in there, which is good. Made it for a good read, a better read. And he says to me, um, why don't we maybe think about relaunching it? We've been speaking himself and John King, another very successful author. Why don't London Books talk about relaunching it under a different name? So I said, then we sat just over a glass of something, and I said, well, there's been 11 years past. What's happened? Well, of course, when I... I went down the road of 11 years. What had happened, quite a lot had happened. Um, sadly, I'd, I'd lost my parents, um, so Downs and my father-in-law, and my best friend, Johnny Fagan. And on the upside, I had children and grandchildren born, and I had sporting achievements, like the European Championship. I wrongfully went to prison, a little bit, just for a short while, um, on remand. All these little bits, I had a comeback fight. At 45 year old, 44, 45, you're too old to fight, you're an old man, leave it alone. So I did this stuff, and it was quite a bit to talk about 11 years. So it now come out the Gypsy Joe rolled into Kushti. And um, if I'm to be perfectly honest, 11 years ago, I wouldn't have minded it being successful and made a few quid out of it. Now I've got zero interest of the making a few quid. I'd rather go round, try and play a little bit of a role model if I can. Without being boastful, some of these young lads, just a bit I wish spoke now, and it's about saving, doing a decent a decent thing in life by trying to help others a bit. So I can talk about my positivity. There's enough positivity in there, and I can hopefully deter the youngsters from going down the negative road. And if I can do that a little bit, I'll be extremely happy. If it sells a million copies, that wouldn't be too bad either. Mm. <laughs> but that's it, really. That's why I want to do it, get the word out there. Nice way to spread the message. Absolutely. Such a powerful way to end the interview, Joe, with that inspirational message for young people. So I really appreciate you coming on. And um, if people have watched this interview then today, here's the book, Kushti. Beautiful artwork. A Romani there, Life. Yeah. Nice, yeah. yeah. The link will be in the description box below the video to get this. And also we'll have the link there for Christian, KRN TV, who organised the interview, and Jen for co-hosting today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So let us know in the comments what you thought. Huge thanks to Joe and James for coming out and filming it. Thanks and, for and having us. Huge thanks to Joe. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> thanks for having us. Up. Thank you. Lovely to you. Thank you. You too. Here at Boomer and Jen, we offer a wide range of organic or recycled clothing. We all know our planet is important. We only have this one, so it's vital that we all work together to slow down and reverse the changes to the environment. Whilst we all know that big industry are having a significant effect on pollution, here at Boomer and Gen, we believe that if we all make small changes, we can do our part. Fast fashion causes detrimental effects to the planet. Not only is nearly 20% of global wastewater produced by the fast fashion industry, but there is a considerable amount of fast fashion ending up in landfill. So let's move away from fast fashion items that are only worn once or twice and start wearing extremely comfortable, durable and environmentally friendly clothing and ethical jewellery. Boomer and Jen was founded in a quiet town in Devon in 2018. It has now gone from strength to strength as the world is becoming more aware of the current climate situation, helping our customers to buy sustainable, quality clothing. All of our products are fair trade and registered with the Global Organic Textiles Standard Association. Check us out on organiccottonclothing.co.uk